So welcome to It's Not All About The Numbers, the leadership podcast that doesn't just focus on the bottom line. Hi, my name is Chris and that is Mike. Hey everyone. And our co-host this week is a seagull. (laughs) We're sat on the beach. Um, In fact, we might have even had a special introduction, um, but we'll come on to that with uh, our new title music, um, Holiday Special. Um, But uh, yeah, this week we are literally sat by the coast enjoying the the summer in England. And uh, we're gonna have a chat about our holidays. And uh, I think this is probably the last of our summer specials. So enjoy it, the last of the summer wine. Um, before we get back on to our normal interviews. Um, but I feel very much out of practice and I'll, I'll stop rambling. So, uh, Mike, how's your, how's your month been, you it, lucky man? It's, it's been interesting. So, yeah, I spent the last month in the US on a family road trip, uh, been in Los Angeles, Las Vegas, lots of national parks, Yosemite, Yellowstone, San Francisco, all round. Um, and I'm currently going through that kind of down period of just got back home. Oh, this is my real life. I have to work. I've got a job. Damn. Yeah. Um, and, and I just wanted to clarify one thing is we're, we're not literally sat on the beach and we're not actually on holiday together. But, you no, know, I live no. nearby here and you you're down near. here. This so is true. We've just met up. <laughs> this is this this is true, and um, but we do have a, a a special guest in a in a seagull. We do, uh, who's perched right in front of us uh, outside the car that we're in. This is a this is a car cast, um, and uh, he's looking quite menacing actually. But um, you just told me an interesting fact that they are. They're endangered species. Uh, appar- apparently, they're on the uh, the red list, uh, according to Springwatch and Chris Packham earlier on in the year. Um, yeah, so th- th- their habitat is under threat, and they are under threat, apparently. Well, there you go. We've covered bad data already, so we won't need to worry about good data, bad data this week. But, um, but yeah, my week, uh, well, my month has been interesting. Obviously, we've been covering a lot of the uh, the podcasts while you've been away. Um, and I'm sure you'll return the compliment at some point when I go on a four-week holiday. <laughs> um, but that's been really enjoyable, getting the favourites out there. And uh, I think Giuseppe was a deserved winner of the audience favourite, which uh, I believe went out last week. Um, work-wise, we finished the Academy programme for November which I am super proud of. We put a lot of work into the content on it. Um, It's covering our AAA agility analytics and automation, but also we sort of ramped up the high performance part of it, which we think a lot of leadership uh, also want. Um, So that's all finished and launched and uh, yeah, well done team for doing that. You're going to have to do a little bit more than that. You're going to have to explain what the Academy is and when it is. Okay, well, I don't like doing adverts, you know this, but you know, go and check it out. Um, yeah, it's a it's a four day virtual conference now. Um, the first two days are sort of a real rich mix of panel discussions, fireside chats, um, all on those topics that I mentioned. It's focused on the accounting and finance profession, but there's a lot of relevant stuff in there just for general business leadership. Um, the third day, slightly longer form masterminds, and the fourth day is a, is a community day for all of our members. Um, and we love it. I, I think it's really leading edge content. Um, our audience is growing. You know, we've we've got a couple new strategic partnerships on it as well. So yeah, we're hoping for a really really good result uh, this time around. And it's in November, so it starts on the oh, with a bang the fifth of November. And uh, finishes on the, yeah, uh, you can see the marketing. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's coming out. Um, and then it finishes on the Friday, um, where I'm actually sort of double heading our own conference and uh, another conference that I'm meant to be at. I've got no idea how I'm going to do that, but uh, I said yes to both, so I'm going to make sure I can do both. But yeah. Anyway, thanks for the advert. So, 
back to you. So you've just been in America, and yep. like it's impossible not to have a chat about Joe uh, Biden um, from a leadership point of view, right? This isn't a po- political podcast, but what what was going on with Joe? Um, was he, you know, was he a bit in denial? Was he resisting change? Um, you know, was he unwell? Was it all of the above? You know, what do leaders do when they find themselves needing to hand the towel in? That's it's a really interesting question. I suppose just to just to contextualise that from my perspective of being in the US. So I was in the US both when Donald Trump was shot at, but also the in the following week uh, we were in Las Vegas the day before Joe Biden arrived. So. Of course, Joe, I forgot you were there for that. Yeah, so Joe, Bi- Joe Biden landed in Las Vegas um, the day the, the day that we were there, and all the airfields were shut, and all all of the stuff was closed, and the Secret Service were literally everywhere. So that was quite interesting in and of itself. But obviously, that was that was the like last bit of the Joe Biden's campaign, really. So he caught COVID whilst he was there, yeah, um, and then. A week later, he pulled out of the race. But I think, to your question about what goes on there, I think, I think that that, that le- leaders can sometimes suffer from a, a I'm I'm needed perspective. I had a really interesting piece of advice from somebody years ago now, uh, a leader who I, I well respect, who was I const you know their words I constantly try to do myself out of a job. So actually, mm. success is when I I'm not needed anymore. And actually, Joe Biden came into the presidency saying that he was going to be like this interim candidate that's going to sort of transition. But it's almost like he's got to a point when the people around him have got to a point where he was the only person that could stand up to Donald Trump. He was the only person that could do some of the things that he did. And it was almost like they got to that point of believing their own yeah. uh, indispensability. I think that's really common in, in yeah, business leadership so. as well, though, right? It's, it's, it's where you, you know, and it's not an ego thing. It's just, um, it's a perception that you have that, you know, you're so important to what's happening. Things will not happen as well without you. You know, they might happen without you, but, you know, are, are, is, is the team going to cover all the bases? Is the team going to represent, you know, what we do in the same way? You know, can I truly delegate to the team and feel comfortable with it um and i think it's it's a very common issue for a lot of leaders who you know have worked damn hard to get into those roles and it's almost like a contra way of thinking that okay now i'm i'm actually not needed well so so i think we've talked about this sort of obliquely before in the difference between leadership and management um so i think there's this kind of like command and control thing that old fashioned sort of manager top top dog needs to be over everything and be an expert in everything and make all of this decisions and i think where we're moving to and where we've or where we've moved to in this kind of multifunctional approach to stuff is a leader is actually somebody who knows that they're not indispensable but actually enables a bunch of people that are working for them to deliver so actually the more i think the more modern leader now realizes that actually other people need to step in and lead lead different bits yeah and i think that's the difference um so so, so yeah i think it's almost like i think it's a throwback i think joe the joe biden thing is a bit of a throwback to thinking i'm the only person that can deal with this yeah i think it's it's one of those things where i think a lot of leaders c- can fall into a trap where they you know they see themselves as top of a hierarchy yeah. and that's a very traditional way of looking at work i think you know you you mentioned you know a, a past boss saying to you you know do yourself out of a job the, i think a, a very good boss of mine has always said you know recruit smarter than yourself recruit a specialist in those roles exactly. rather than just someone who you know you think you can manage or lead and you know i think if you if you're in the luxury position to be able to do that because obviously that comes with cost and you know demands on your time then then definitely do it because you know your you know the irony with it is that by doing that you're actually going to look even better as a boss because yes. you've got the sort of specialisms across a multidisciplinary team 
rather than the traditional approach, which is like I'm sat at the top of, you know, this hierarchy that I know 100% and I can do everybody's job and they can come to me with all their answers and get all the questions and get all the answers rather than kind of giving away some of that responsibility of leadership and management and saying, look, you've just got to own this now and I'll judge you on delivery. Um, but what with Joe, like, I think he, you know, he had a very able person in, um, you know, Carmela. Is it Carmela? I don't know. Okay. Well, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's, it's whoever, you know. How you pronounce it, I'm not yeah. sure. I know how Donald Trump pronounces it and it's not like that. Okay. <laughs> so, but, you know, he, he had a very able vice president in, in Carmela Harris. So, you know, why wasn't he a bit quicker um, just to say, you know what? Let's, let's give it a go. I, I think, it, I mean, probably that comes comes down to denial a yeah. little bit. Um, I think, I think every, in the end, it, what really did for Joe Biden in terms of the decision-making process seems to have been the, um, the, the, the preemptive um, debate with, with Donald Trump, where he could, uh, Joe Biden couldn't really string a sentence together properly or answer you know he clearly had points he was trying to make but couldn't make them coherently it was scary though it, that, that interview was was shocking like from the most powerful man arguably in the world you know not being able to construct an argument it, you know but i think it was in my view is it was in that environment so he was in that environment of under pressure it didn't mean that he's not competent to be in my view competent to be president at the moment but it just means his brain isn't working in the way of a you know 50 year old person would be in that exact exact same scenario but what it did highlight is under pressure and under that pressure he he was struggling i think in terms of the decision to to step aside and let uh carmela step step into the into the into the um presidential race i I don't think that that was the decision. I think the decision was whether to step aside or not, whether to whether he was still competent enough or not. I mean, to the point we were just making around team, I, you know, all the news that you hear is that the team around Joe Biden is good. The reason that, broadly speaking, from afar, the pres- his presidency has been successful is because the team around him is good. Yeah. So he had done that enabling piece. Yeah. But I just think that fundamentally it was a bit of denial around needing to step aside and actually thinking that at 80, whatever it is, he's still as sharp as and, and fast as a 50-year-old. Yeah. Yeah, and you make a really good point around, you know, if he, like, like as, an, as an MD, let's say, or, or a CFO or whatever, the business leader, if he is enabling the team, recruiting the team, finding the best talent around him, to get the job done, and I think you know he he's he's again not a political statement, but he's he's got a good record. Um, I think publicly people agree with that. It's like he's he's done the majority of his job if yeah. he's enabled that team around him, um, and he should be able to, or, or the leader should be able to change, and the and the team you know remain functioning and effective and the results i just wonder whether there's something around you know a new leader coming in changing perspectives but actually nothing's really changed you know the the team's still strong the team's able to deliver but you still need that new figurehead for like optics almost right so i i can't i mean the other thing that's been going on is that we've had a change of government here in the UK, and yeah. the, the top te- the top team in effect in the UK has changed, but the civil service underneath it is still the same. So, what, what, it, it's a, a similarish situation where you've got that that kind of change that that transition, but what does that actually mean? And it's an opportunity. Any change, any any kind of like sharp change of of anything. I mean to 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 a quote that we've had before which is you need that kind of firestorm of pressure to make changes and make transitions i can't remember the exact quote but you know the one i'm alluding to uh what pressure makes diamonds yeah well no, <laughs> it was it was um we need it was burnt's um statement in oh yes yes um 
Yeah, he was saying they need to feel the pain. Yeah, <laughs> you need to feel the pain before. And I think that make the change. And I think yeah. that the change of leadership and change of approach. Thank you for helping me there. Sure. That the change of leadership and change of approach at the top allows like like different ideas to come through and different ways of doing things to come through, even if the team underneath is still the same. So it. It enables a whole f- re- refresh. You know, yeah. a change is as good as a rest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, and I think, you know, again, reflecting on the business side of life, maybe in, you know, I've been on transformation programs where essentially the team's been the same for two different programs, but the head has been different. And one head has absolutely nailed the communication, you know, the the sort of the relationship management, um, being seen as a leader, and the other one, let's just say, has not. And I think what happens is people don't believe in it. Like, even though the team is able and effective, the the change that you're trying to make has to be believed in, you know? And if you don't win hearts and minds, then it's unlikely to move forward certainly easily um but i but i'd say if you're not winning hearts and minds you know things are unlikely to be adopted even if they are implemented properly right well i think i i'm going to make a, a a sort of silly analogy now so um, as an aston villa football fan right you know for yeah. a, for a, we had so steven gerrard was the manager of aston villa for a period of time and basically got sacked because the team were close to relegation a new manager Unai Emery came in mm. the team didn't change but all of a sudden virtually the same team ends up in the Champions League yeah, yeah. so what, what's the difference yeah. and the difference is that management style management approach and well, that... it, it was the same with the rugby team and Stuart Lancaster yeah you know he brought in a load of you know young lads and he was sort of criticised for his leadership style being a bit too maybe school teacher um, but but then you know, as soon as it changed, it was the same group of people who delivered. Um, yep. But our, and I, and it was only within a sort of year or so. So, you know, what what is happening there? You know, is it is there is it unfair to say that it's the leader? You know, not delivering. It sounds like that's what you're saying, but there must have been something not right. Well, I think it's. I think well, that's why we work in transformation, right? Is because it, that bit is difficult to diagnose, yeah. and that bit is the bit that you need to create frameworks and approaches to in, in to enable um, that that those transitions and transformations. So, but there's only so many times you can say trust the process, you know, until people go, yeah, okay, trust the process, but we've got to start delivering. We've got to start getting the results. And may, maybe there's something in the way that you approach, you know, your programs, your projects, your goals, whatever, to, to guarantee that um, that happens, you know, so you don't lose people on the journey. It, it may be that's where the uh, the analogy with, with football and rugby falls down <laughs> somewhat, because obviously the, the results business is much more immediate in both of those things where, you, you know, the cha- changes and trans- transformations have to happen instantly rather yeah, yeah. than over a period of time. Yeah, it's like if the A team, the international team, is losing, but you can say, but look, the, the B team's winning, so give us a year and yeah. we'll, be, we'll be fine. Like, you know, you might have, an, you might have a case in, in the business environment, but, you know, obviously on, in a sporting world, that's not going to go down very well. Um, yeah, I, I think that the, the the analogy is around the change of leadership being an opportunity for the same people to deliver differently, I think is the point that I was yeah. m- making. I, I don't think that necessarily the analogy stretches to the approach that you should take, which is if it's not working, fire everyone. <laughs> well, talking of firing people... Um... <laughs> Where's this going? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mike. <laughs> this is a breakup uh, episode. No, the, we, so we've had a change of government in the UK and, you know, sim, similar situation in a way, I suppose, where, like you said, you've got the civil service who are going to deliver no matter what. Um, it must be a really weird situation for the civil service, though, where they do almost have this, you know, change of leadership. But essentially what they do, you know, has to remain consistent and solid. I know you can't talk too much about this, but... 
Yeah. So I can a bit more than pre-election. But okay. I, so I think I think there's what, so what's changed at the, at the top level is some he- headline policies and headline and, and priorities probably more than policies. So th- those things change the emphasis of what you need to do. But quite a lot. So day to day delivery will be be the same. We still need to build flood defences. Yeah. Um, we met. We were chatting before the podcast about a big bit of engineering that's just going on down to our, our left hand side. A bit that's government funded. That still has to happen. Yeah. Did, um, did you know you you were very much ahead of your time as well? Like wow. There was a there was a podcast we did which I caught. I don't know how. Um, and you were talking about the Timpson. Oh yeah. Uh, guy. Yes. Um, being a you know a shining example of how to get you know people into the workplace and a good leader and what is he now he's now the prisons minister yeah exactly so there you go but, so it's definitely worth listening to this podcast for those uh, one or two nuggets exactly, that occasionally exactly. pop, pop up you know but i mean it's like the simpsons you know if you if you go back <laughs> far enough there's lots of predictions in here that have come true uh, yes uh, anyway, to, 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 the, to, the, to, the, to the point that you, were, that you thought you were making is that there's definitely stuff that has to continue happening, but over a period of time, because the priorities have shifted slightly, things will start to be done differently and some things will stop. Um, the, you know, Rwanda being a classic one week, you see instantly it's stopped. Mm. Um, so it, it, there's a, like a blend of things which are completely politically driven, but some of the things are just keeping the show on the road. But the messaging is Im- important, right? Like I, kn- I know we talk about, you know, in, in, in government, it's policies and priorities, but, you know, the message. So if you're leading a team, you know, for instance, Rachel Reeve came in and started talking about growth, 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 business, business, yeah. business. And it was almost like it was everything that people didn't expect her to say, um, you know, and, and they were pitching themselves as this sort of business growth part party yeah the the that aside the messaging from leadership is important right it's it's gonna make or break you know and i don't and i don't mean the disaster like joe biden's speech i mean that the nuance in those messages it's gonna mean the difference between someone engaging and someone not engaging with their their priorities their programs their projects i just well i suppose there's two ways of looking at that so you've got the the external view and the internal view. The internal view within like the government structures will be that clearly growth the growth agenda is clearly the direction of travel. So therefore, everything that you're doing and thinking about doing that's new needs to fit into that agenda, or it won't be approved. So there's that. Yeah. So so actually, that's how the alignment within works. And then I suppose the external view is if that's the messaging and it's really clear but within that messaging the opportunities are clear mm. so one of the things that Rachel Reeves has or, or the, the whole of the kind of labour machine has been talking about is this need for public private partnership on investment and actually government can't do this on its own and if the messaging is clear around where the opportunities are for that partnership then those things can move forward and I think that that's where the clarity is really helpful. Mm. Um, did, did you know, by the way, she was, uh, she was part of our NCT group I, uh, 11 years ago? I, I, I didn't. You need to, you need to ex- explain. A, you probably need to explain to people who don't know what NCT is, what NCT is. But also, you know, yeah. are you still in touch? N- are you still fr- do you still N- have canapes and N- wine? I couldn't possibly say. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I've not got an invite to number 11 uh, yet, I'd like to say. Uh, no, NCT. So when when you have um, kids, there, there's sort of almost like a, a club you can go to. to boot with, camp. With, with a, yeah, like, exactly. It's like pre-birth boot camp. And, um, yeah, we were we were living in the same area at the time. And uh, we, we went along. And lovely she was you know working in government i think at the time her husband's working in the treasury which makes it quite interesting now because now her she's the the boss of her husband yeah but a completely um, different kind of growth at the time right growth yeah nct it's a different kind of growth it is a different kind of growth yeah um but no just on a personal level she was she, she was you know lovely um and yes we have stayed in contact um, but who knows, might get her on the pod one day. 
Rachel, if you're listening, <laughs> come and come and give us a scoop. Um, but sorry, where were we? <laughs> I've totally, totally forgot where we are. We, we definitely got that holiday spirit. I think everybody can yeah. tell. Oh, <laughs> on that note, bit of an update. So the the goal was lying down, and now the seagull is back on two legs. It was on one leg for a while. Um, but he's still there, menacing. I think we've kind of got his spot here. Yeah, I've, t- I've taken a picture, right. so I can post a picture. Okay, well, let's make sure we do that. And, but anyway, mo- moving on. Um, and yes, you can tell we're a bit rusty, so apologies for that. But if um, we did actually ask people whether um, they had any ideas for guests for, for future co-hosts, um, and I think we've had a good sort of 20 odd people submit names, which has been fantastic. So thank you to everybody who, who put all that um, effort in and we will start recruiting. And if you do want to put your name forward or someone that you know, then you can reach out to us on LinkedIn or use the email podcast at generationcfo.com. Um, and it's at this point where we normally ask a question so let's ask a question just to try and get a little bit of structure back into this, which is clearly totally unstructured. So I, the, the general sort of point here, I suppose, is, is you know, culture and, and the way that we work and the things that we say are all really important to change and transformation. So, you know, how, how does culture really play into change in a business context? Um, you know, does does it matter? You know, can you just sort of implement stuff and, and sometimes it'll be adopted and you don't have to do much work or, or does it always matter? I mean, it it always matters, I think. Um, I, I, I've come, I used the term culture, culture change um, in a kind of like a, a mantra. So when people talk about culture change, they usually mean somebody else. Mm-hmm. So, oh yeah, the culture of this organisation needs to change. They probably mean the other people. But actually, if you start thinking, if you, it, it should be more about behaviour change. Yeah. And behaviour change includes me. So everybody has to change and adapt and move and shift. And I think that, so, so there's something in when people use the term culture, what do they actually mean? Um, it's that classic, there's a classic cartoon where, I think I mentioned it before, where there's a there's a there's a leader stood at a podium with a team in front of him and he's saying you know we want change and everyone's cheering and then the question is who wants to change yes and then the the crowd goes quiet and then it's who's going to lead the change and then there's only one person in the audience and it's it's true like we think that change can happen with everybody else moving first right yeah, and we, everybody else has to move to what we think they need to do, and that's probably based on our own prejudices and bias and thoughts. But actually, change is a is, is a collegiate thing. We yeah. need to work, and, and I think that what comes through in um, discussions around change and transformation in business is is very much how do you build a community around it? How do you convince people that they need to work together on it? How do you actually agree the changes that are needed across a group? Because then they're much more likely to happen. Yeah. If you are imposing change, um, it, it it doesn't often work. Um, I remember things like technology being rolled out in when I used to work in the environment agency years ago. I remember a new email system, and it was it was imposed. It was like here's a brand new email system, and we're going to Im- embed these rules and things into it, and you've just got to do this. And it's just like, well, that just doesn't work with my workflows. Yeah. So you end up resisting the change. Yeah. Whereas if you had worked together and co-designed that that specific transformation, it was much more likely to be successful. I did, the way that I sort of summarise or, or plain English speak culture is is it's it's the way we work. You know, it's it's the way we work. It's our behaviours. It's our attitudes towards you know what we do on a daily basis. And if you change anything it is significant like if you are and I think people sort of really underplay this it's like oh well we're only sort of you know changing the way that you I don't know you know sign off this contract um you know we're moving it from paper to electric or something it's like you know what's the big deal and it's like but hang on 
you know, th there is an emotional response to this. There's a relationship response to this. There's obviously the technology and implementation, you know, considerations. There's, you know, there's the job that they have has now actually changed. You know, there's so much that needs to be considered in the change management role. And, you know, I know that we've spoken about this in the past. We've always said that, you know, if there's a six months of implementation, then you you probably need a similar amount of effort on the change management as well. Yeah. Because and but but normally people are just like, well, let's do some training at the end and you oh. know assume everyone's going to align. I mean, I've got a, a really kind of glib example to illustrate exactly that point around culture, I think, and change. Which is, I remember working in an office where um, there was fresh ground coffee provided. So the organisation provided fresh ground coffee, filter coffee. You could go and make, you know, fill it up, make it, press the button, start it, and run it. And obviously, in an office environment, you've got the coffee, the coffee tea machine culture where people go there to chat and da -da 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 -da, and it builds relationships. And then, for probably perfectly good reasons of cost, that was stopped. But it was yeah. stopped in a way which was done so badly it was just like well we're basically not providing this anymore at all we're taking all the facilities away and you've just got to you know lump it yeah and that emotional response to that change which was probably logical and actually that perk was probably over the top anyway yeah but the emotional response was incredible and the morale effect that it had was incredible yeah i i i totally get it i think the 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 funniest sort of story in a way that I've seen which illustrates that point is the sausage on the railway breakfast I don't know if I've spoken about this before um, yeah seagull update still there yeah still pruning so still I, still staring us out Chris says that because as he's talking I'm taking a pic another picture <laughs> um, but the sausage the so it was so funny I was working for a large kind of um, food supplier to the to the global kind of transport industry and they supplied the British rail system and um, and they basically decided that the, the breakfast was too complex in first class to, to do on a daily basis and too costly so they decided to take the sausage away and they didn't consult anybody on it they were just like no, let's take it away and what they didn't realise was a lot of people who travel first class are politicians with a lot of influence, uh, senior business people with a lot of influence, um, and also this very British view that you can't a breakfast isn't a breakfast without a sausage. <laughs> <laughs> so it it was an absolute shit show for from a PR point of view, and they resisted it and then they brought the sausage back in. So it's like my my the funniest story that kind of illustrates that um that reason to consider your audience when uh, you're making change but and and just sort of linking that back to the culture thing right so it, it the, the the culture is one of sausage with breakfast but the decision was probably perfectly reasonable yeah, so that so that the yeah. transition and the change could have been managed probably so much better. Certainly, like with the coffee example, yeah. so much better. And actually, I, I realise that both of those examples might seem glib, but actually, if you take them into like the, a, a more business environment where you're rolling out a new piece of software or you're changing how you expect people to do invoicing, yeah. people are comfortable with how they've done things for the past. 15 20 years or however long it is people are comfortable with the processes as they are and if you're coming in and just changing them overnight people will be very uncomfortable with that so you need to manage that transition so that people know what they're going to get why they're going to get it so they buy in and it once once people sort of understand the motivation and buy in the the transition is still going to be easy clearly though i'm still bitter and twisted about the coffee thing even 15 <laughs> years on so so yeah you still have to work at it. Yeah, and don't mess with my sausage for breakfast as well. <laughs> anyway, on that note, so uh, I think that's a wrap. Um, I'm conscious of time. We'll have to get all of our um, catchphrases back very soon. Uh, I definitely used the, there's definitely two things in that one. There's two things in yeah, that one, yeah. and uh, that was very interesting. You like? I don't think you said that today, so maybe I need to work on this. <laughs> but very interesting. Um, Anyway, that's it. So next week we are back on track. Um, we will have all of our 
sort of regular interviews with great people coming um, to your feed. So make sure you subscribe or do the five star thing. It really helps. And um, we have uh, a special next week um, in that we're having a sort of bit of a retro podcast with um, Lynn Titley, who was our second speaker, our second co-host on the podcast when it went live. Um, I think we're up to about 45 episodes now. Um, so it's going to be nice to sort of go back and reflect on that with Lynn. And the reason why I mentioned Lynn is because the uh, the intro and the outro music, the special summer version with the seagulls and the foghorn, is courtesy of Lynn and uh, Lynn's husband who uh, remixed it for us. Um, so uh, it's lovely to to have you know our own music production department. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I hope they don't invoice us. But uh, yeah, thank you, Lynn, and uh, thanks for listening. And uh, thank you, Mike. Thanks, everyone. And remember, it's not all about the numbers. Mm-hmm.